I'm Jill Featherstone, Director of Museum Education and Interpretation, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual lecture led by artist Olivia Valentine on the occasion of her solo exhibition at the Des Moines Arts Center. And although we are in a virtual space together, we are all in physical spaces individually, and I'd like to begin this program with a land acknowledgement. So in any way that you can, um, I'd like to invite you to get comfortable and kind of put your two feet on the floor if that's a way you can get comfortable or rest your hands in your lap and just take, take a moment to connect with yourself and your breath and think about the space that you are occupying. And um, you can close your eyes if you'd like, um, but this is a short land acknowledgement this afternoon. These lands on which we gather is the traditional and ancestral land of the Native Americans who preceded us, and we honor those who are still with us. Thank you. So in a moment, I will introduce Jared Ledesma, who is the curator of Olivia's exhibition, but next comes the recitation of the Zoom preferences. So for today, um, kindly keep yourselves muted during Olivia's comments. However, feel free to use the chat for any observations, uh, comments, or compliments um, that you'd like to share with the group. And we'll ask that you save your questions for the end of the program. And um, if you are comfortable, please ask them directly to Olivia. So that's the time to unmute yourself. Um, and the best way we can, we're gonna try to imitate what it would be like being in the museum together and talking. I think that we all really miss that opportunity. And I know um, that that's something that Olivia is really missing right now too. So hopefully we can have a chance to talk with each of you in person when you have your questions at the end. Um, however, if that doesn't work for you, you go ahead and feel free to pose your question in the chat and I will bring that forward during the Q&A. So now on to Jared Ledesma. Um, several of you have probably met Jared before, but if you haven't, he joined the Art Center staff in 2017 and is currently serving as the associate curator. He has mounted the exhibitions I2M America, The Irrational and the Marvelous, an exhibition of works by Grant Wood in our collection and the groundbreaking exhibition Queer Abstraction, which was honored in 2020 with an award for outstanding exhibition and catalog of contemporary materials. And most recently, Olivia Valentine's stunning exhibition Mediate Equivocate, which continues the museum's commitment since 1949 to showcasing, to showcasing artists with strong connections to Iowa. So Jared, thank you so much for working on this exhibition and presenting it for us to uh, enjoy and absorb. So I'll have you introduce Olivia. Thanks, Jill. Um, it's really nice to see everyone virtually. Um, I kind of want to do like shout outs like, hi, Noah, hi, Mary, <laughs> hi, Julia, <laughs> but that would take too long. So, <laughs> um, but it's great to see everyone and um, yeah, and thank you, Jill. And I, every time you do that land acknowledgement, I get a little, um, it's beautiful. So thank you for doing that. Um, I met Olivia in 2017 when I first got here. I, I forgot how we were introduced, um, probably at a function of some sort, but um, we went to get Indian food together. That was our first um, date. And um, it was awesome because I was really missing really good Indian food. And um, it was a great conversation. And um, I went back to the art center and said, we have to give Olivia a show. Her work is amazing. And I think she's one of the most brilliant artists working in Iowa today. And I'm really proud that she's a subject of our Iowa artists this year. And um, um, it's been over a little over two years, I think, in the making. It's um, with a lot of hard work from Olivia and our crew here at the Art Center, um, but I think it's um, beautiful um, and one of the most ambitious Iowa artist exhibitions that we've ever executed. So bravo to Olivia and to everyone involved. Um, so Olivia Valentine is assistant professor in the College of Design at Iowa State University. She earned a Fulbright Fellowship and the Branford Elliott Award for Excellence in Fiber Arts. And I had to look that up because I hadn't heard of that. I was unfamiliar with it before. Um, and it was established in the 1990s to honor the lives of, um, I think it's Joanne Branford. And um, oh, I'm forgetting the second name, uh, two fiber artists um, who look, their work looks amazing. I should become more familiar with them. So that's awesome. 
Um, in 2020, Olivia was the recipient of the Ira Arts Fellowship, and her work has been shown at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, the Danish Royal Academy in Copenhagen, and the American Academy in Rome. Olivia earned an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. So without further ado, Olivia Valentine. Oh, thank you, Jared, for such a lovely introduction. Um, and I feel like maybe Matt Greiner introduced us originally. Um, I feel like we were in my studio next door during an open studio. Um, and I'd forgotten that we had Indian food as our first date, um, but we should go back, though I've heard they've moved locations. Um, so let me just, uh, I'm going to get started with a screen share here, and then we will get started. Um, All right, can you see that everyone? That's great, yep. Okay, and you can hear me okay. Um, so I am calling in actually from my studio in downtown Des Moines. Sometimes on Sundays it gets a little rowdy, so I hope we don't have any uh, noise interruptions. But um, thank you, Jared, for that lovely introduction um, and Jill for hosting this event today and certainly for the Art Center um, and all of their support um, for putting together this as Jared said, rather ambitious uh, exhibition that I felt just really proud to be able to, to do, especially during this time with COVID. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing my work with all of you today. Um, most of the work in this exhibition has been made either in 2020 or since then, um, or immediately preceding that. Um, so I also just wanted to think about um, one thing that's been on my mind getting ready for this talk is that in, in our current environment, ultimately this can't be a normal artist talk or certainly a normal gallery talk um, specifically for this show. Um, and part of that is that a number of people who are here today can come and see the exhibition um, or maybe already have. Uh, Kay, thanks for your note that you got there today before the talk, I really appreciate that. Um, but a number of people here also will never be able to see this show. And um, so this leaves me with a bit of a conundrum because the exhibition that I've made here, um, I ultimately feel really does need to be seen in person in the flesh and as an experience. Um, it's based on experiences that I've both found and made in the art center having lived here at nearby this building and this institution for the past five years and having been thinking about this show for the past two years. Um, and ultimately with the changes that happened with COVID, I had to reimmerse myself again um, after the pandemic started working to restructure and rethink and reimagine the way that this exhibition might come together. Um, so I guess I start that talk, the talk today with that in mind, um, because I think that um, it's certainly, you know, thinking about a talk for a show is one thing, right? Where I've made a specific body of work and I did ultimately, as I was putting this project together, know that it would be happening during the pandemic um, while we are so highly mediated by our screens and so distant from one another, but also that the Art Center has been open um, and available to the public since last summer. Um, and that making something to be seen in person and in the flesh seems really important ultimately during this time. Um, so I've been used to having my work seen mostly through documentation for a long time. Um, in fact, my history as a photographer makes this more possible and also a more intimate part of my work and process. Um, but I'm also, because of this, innately aware of the limitations and shortcomings of photography. Um, the mediation of the screen and of the camera um, makes so much possible for us, but it also loses the ability to have sort of free access to this show within this talk. I think ultimately had the times been different, I would have loved to have spent more time with more people in the galleries. Um, I have been doing that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but um, for this talk, that's impossible. Um, so ultimately I encourage for those of you who can see the show, I hope that you do. Um, and for those of you who can't, I hope that this gives some access that was otherwise unavailable. Um, I'm really honored to be able to speak to a wide audience about this show today. Um, and so the way that I've structured this talk um, is as a walk through the galleries, if we were there together, um, with a few meanders through related areas of my work and practice. Um, so here today, I will start with two pieces uh, of older work um, that I think 
somewhat frame and inform the work that I was doing in the art center. Um, I often now start and think about framing my work with this piece made over 10 years ago um, that for me so clearly illustrates my background's interest and practice, um, both where I came from and also where I am now. Um, I come to my work as someone who has both studied and worked in photography, architecture, drawing, and also ultimately textiles. Um, this multidisciplinary and multimedia background is essential to how I think about my work um, and my practice. And in this piece in particular is one of the first places where these intersections of architecture, photography, and textiles interact, um, ultimately resulting in something that I think of and consider as a drawing. Um, so here you see a view out a window um, in a building in downtown Chicago, looking out across State Street. Um, the piece was originally made by taking a photograph with a 50 millimeter lens, the ones that's closest to our eye, um, capturing this view out the window at 22 and a half feet away, which had to do with the interior architecture of the space. Um, and then ultimately that photograph became the size of the window, became this opening, this frame, um, but also the pattern for this textile structure um, that I created um, at full size. And then at first rehung in the window like a curtain. This was the original installation in 2010. Um, here you can see my interest and relationship between specifically edges, edges of the buildings, right? And the way that they intersect and also that relationship to the fabric edge, which is where a, pla a place where lace, which well, I won't talk about it today, was a big part of my practice um, in the way that things come together um, and also line the edges and mediate between the cloth and the rest of the world in that way. Same with the edges of the building. So here looking at the cornice of this building um, and then the way that I've rendered it in stitches, braids um, and lace making. For me, ultimately this piece became one that was shown on the wall. It became, the first time I got it up on the wall, it became a drawing that I'd always wanted to make, but never had been able to, particularly thinking about the reflections in the glass and the windows um, in these big skyscrapers in downtown Chicago and the way that I was able to capture that, but also thinking about the heaviness of the cloth, the way it responds to gravity, um, the looseness, the tightness and the structure as being part of this idea of drawing. Um, so another series of works that I've been thinking about and also in Shannon Stratton's essay, she writes about these um, as well a little bit, but um, in 2012 and 13, I was in Turkey. Um, I was there on a Fulbright fellowship in part to research the edge lace of Oya, which is what goes around the edge of a headscarf. Um, traditionally, it was a place where um, women were able to project their feelings out to an outside world when they were otherwise um, muted or unable to speak or share. Um, and so it cr created this place of transition, right? Where we were able to have interior emotions projected outside, but there was also a, a protection from inside to outside. Um, so over the course of my year in Turkey, researching Oya, um, learning how to make it, and then ultimately trying to make installations, I here you can see some beaded contemporary Oya where I'm thinking about that at the scale of the landscape. Um, this shift in scale is always really important to me in my work. Um, and then ultimately it became two installations, one in the city here in Istanbul in the back alley. Um, I created an Oya for the edge of the city or the edge of a building, um, which ultimately transgresses um, or punctures this threshold of the window, that opening um, that's been so often important to me. And then later working in the rural uh, region of Cappadocia, I walked across the edges of the mountains there um, using my body to mimic the structure of the Oya, thinking about this ornamented edge and finding a sort of difficult to place edge along the tops of these table mountains that are specific to the Cappadocia region and really iconically known for that. Um, and so here are the series of works that are called Yuru Yish Oyasa um, or Walking Oya. Um, this one, Pembe Kinar or Pink Edge. Um, and so with these two bodies of work, um, I come to the art center. Um, here you can see the final proposal that I made for the Meyer Galleries and Atrium um, for this installation that was called Mediate, that is called Mediate Equivocate. Um, on the left, you can see the upper and 
middle levels of the gallery in the Meyer wing. Um, and on the right, this three-story atrium wall. This is one side and the other of the same, the same piece of architecture. Um, the installation is essentially seven sets of stitches or woven threads through the central atrium wall. The structure and pattern are based both on um, the existing architecture as designed as by Richard Meyer. Um, and also the artworks installed in the galleries and my own experiences of the spaces. The pattern is developed out of a style of weaving called overshot that is essentially a method for weaving a base fabric and a decorative pattern overlay at the same time. Um, I'll show some examples of this later. Um, so over the course of planning for this exhibition, I made several mo models of the Meyer wing to work on ideas about the exhibition. Um, I've got one behind me here in the studio. Um, here you can see a side or section view of the three-story Meyer wing with a graphite pencil line used to make different variations of the stitches on the wall. Um, I find these to be, I think, rather humorous in the way that they slither and slink through the galleries. Um, and I think I've been justified in thinking about this as, as much as there are serious overtones and um, there's also a pretty big humor to making these big stitches in the gallery and in the architecture. Um, and some of that humor and delight, I think, started with some of these drawings, just experimenting with where a thread or rope might ultimately go through the spaces. Um, and so here we begin with a walk through the Meyer wing. Um, this is a view that you might see entering the gallery from the main floor um, as you come in. Currently, the Art Center, for those of you who are not in Iowa, the Art Center is set up with a really guided path through the galleries uh, to help with social distancing. Um, and I feel actually pretty lucky in the way that the way that I'd been thinking about the show and the way that the galleries have been routed are rather simpatico. Um, so here you would come in um, on the main floor of the building um, and you can see some of these stitches puncturing, puncturing the wall, um, cascading down onto the gallery floor. These are an overview again of the stitches from a similar location. Uh, one thing that was, that's been interesting for me about making this piece is that we tend to consider walls as surfaces, not necessarily objects or things with fronts and backs. Um, overshot weaving is a structure that is reversible and potentially equally weighted in importance, both with the front and the back of the fabric. Um, and walls and art spaces in particular have this potential to be viewed as surfaces for maybe the more important art objects as much as our museums and their architecture have become important. Ultimately, the wall surface is not always something that's considered a material for art or art making. It's seen as a ground or an area of display. Um, they're often painted white also as a way of becoming invisible um, support mediums for the art objects. So here I'm also using the wall as a support medium or ground, but to a different end and one that ultimately has two sides. Um, I will say I'm also consciously choosing not to think about one side or the other as a front or a back, um, neither one becoming primary. This is probably the most expansive view that you can see of the installation. Um, another important component of this installation for me and one that I try, I hope I can show a little bit of in the photographs today is that the installation is never able to be seen in full. Um, it's impossible, but here an expansive view of the three-story atrium wall. Um, all the other parts are only parts and pieces with indications maybe to the front and the back, um, the other side. Um, and so now we are down on the ground floor um, on the flip side. And so we'll continue walking through the galleries. This is the other side of the wall on the ground floor. It's not touched by the stitches, but several of my drawings are tucked into the corners of the galleries, the spaces that were have previously been unused by the Art Center for displaying works. Um, I feel like Jared and I can maybe talk about that a bit more later, but I'm certainly interested in using the gallery also in surrounding spaces as architectural spaces and not just wall surfaces, um, giving a bit of a transformation to that space of the wall that's often seen as invisible and making it really present. Um, ultimately, the wall becomes a material as well and an object that can be punctured, transgressed and changed. Um, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, so here, as we start to turn around, 
uh, and walk through the space, you can see two of my drawings in the corner along with other works from the collection, um, as well as a spool um, of rope peeking through the floor there. Um, and so this, this corner actually is a space that really is usually uninhabited um, in the galleries in the art center, um, but I hope to draw people in and make them look. We'll get an upward view a little later. Um, so here are two of the watercolor drawings that are, the two watercolor drawings shown on the ground floor. Um, all four of the drawings that are shown in the Meyer wing were made during the year 2020, almost exclusively after the pandemic started. Um, this is a small watercolor drawing with graphite and on an inkjet print. Um, this was probably the first time that I started making some of these drawings, which are drawings that I've been making since 2015, um, but this time using direct photographic information along with patterning that was taken from woven structures that I was also working on in my studio during that time um, that ultimately are the same structures that puncture the wall um, of the galleries. Here, a larger drawing with watercolor skills that are derived from similar photographs um, and so no photograph, direct photographic information here, but watercolor that is mimicking these shadows of my body, um, as well as intersecting with these pattern structures um, from weaving. These drawings are the most recent iteration of this set of drawings that I've called interruptions. Um, this is one of the very first ones I made um, in 2015 while living in Rome. Much of my work before then had been very vertical in nature. I'd been looking at walls. I'd been looking at vertical openings in architecture. I'd been using my own body, as I showed earlier, vertically in space to define an edge. Um, but almost immediately when I arrived in Rome, my gaze went towards the ground. It started, I started looking at the floor tile patterns and I became really interested in making drawings about those, um, which I think has set off a series of works including ones that we'll look at a little bit later in the pay gallery, where I'm thinking about this horizontal space. Um, so here, looking at patterns, inverting those, disrupting them with these, you know, sort of random spills and accidents. And so here we come back to the gallery. We're in, tucked in this corner, a place where I think not so many people tend to wander at the art center. We have about two feet of gap here between these two walls. We'll see it also from the other side soon. Um, but this, this space of about two feet was actually my initial interest in working in the, in the Meyer wing was how can we sort of span this small gap? Um, and so ultimately I decided to do that with ropes that are stitched through the stitched through the wall um, or appear to be stitched through the wall. Here you can see the stitches um, on the closest side, uh, this running stitch that runs all the way up the side of the wall. Um, and as we come around the other side here, this is looking at where we just, we're just standing um, with the spool. And um, so here you can see the ropes piled up on the ground. Um, and we will start moving up to the main level shortly. The other thing that I certainly have been interested in um, since that very first piece that I showed, um, and certainly I think comes from my interest in you know, work in photography is ideas around framing and point of view. Um, one thing that was, I think, a surprise while putting this exhibition together, I um, proposed putting the drawings in the corners of the gallery from the very beginning, but I actually hadn't realized how fully visible it made them from other points of view in the space. Um, so here you can see a bit of that drawing, uh, Cortez Sunrise from, from across the gallery in the atrium space as opposed to being in the gallery space. Um, and so now we flip to being up in the middle galleries. Um, here with works by Bryce Martin, John Chamberlain, um, and others. <clears throat> the main interface, I would say, an in interference with the installation that I've made is this work, uh, Range, by Bryce Martin, made in 1970. Um, here, the installation responds both to the architecture and also this painting, um, as well as others that you can't see from this point of view, um, specifically across the gallery, Union Pacific by Frank Stella, which was made in 1960. Um, 
here in particular, the interminglings of other works in the collection is most important. Um, during the entire two week installation period where we worked, uh, this painting was in storage to prevent damage and to keep it safe. Um, I'd prepared the drawings for the installation back in November. Um, and so we put the whole installation together and the painting came in then on the very last day. Um, and so I wasn't ultimately sure um, how, how this installation was working really until that painting came in on the very last day of the install. Um, but ultimately I think the ropes functioned, these rope stitches functioned exactly as I had hoped, piercing this vertical ground on which you know, these important works by white male artists was sitting on, changing the point of view and reflect the place of um, focus on the wall to one that comes not only on the painting, but also then to the ground itself um, and the space activating the wall in a different way. Um, ultimately here as well with the Marden painting, I found that, and it, this is hard to see from photographs in the gallery, but I found that, that my, my interest in the painting got redirected to the edges of the painting. And I noticed things along particularly the lower edge that I had never seen before. Um, and so then here we are now back in the atrium space, looking down. Um, at the balcony floor um, where the ropes are piled up um, and then also draping down onto the floor below. And then finally to the upper level of the galleries, um, here from sort of the walkway, we see my drawing um, in the back as well as some of these large stitches. I do feel like uh, ultimately the physicality of these stitches and the way that they exist in the space is impossible to understand over Zoom for sure, but I hope that a little bit of the um, feeling and humor of these can, can get to all of you. Um, and then looking down onto the atrium ground floor from the, from the top floor. Um, and then here walking down the hallway, we get our first glimpse of the other side of this top floor gallery um, here with a painting by uh, Gunther Gerzo in 1966. And so here, this upper level gallery, um, to the far right, you can see the painting we just saw and its neighbor. Um, and then to the left, we have Iago's Mirror by Fred Wilson, 2009. Um, so th then the ropes from my installation go over the top of this wall, making it very clear that it has an end or termination point um, and cascading onto the gallery floor beyond, the, beyond that connection or joint in the wall. Um, there are actually there are no additional anchors or fixtures um, with this installation, just the ropes themselves um, and several handmade spools, one of which is up on the top floor. So the weight of the ropes hold these different strands in various states of tension and slack um, and also occupy the space of the gallery, particularly up here. Um, so here we have a slightly different point of view. The two drawings, neither of which you can see um, necessarily in full, depending on where you're standing. Um, and then to the right, a painting by Glenn Brown. Um, I think it's really important to note here also that most of the works that are shown amongst mine uh, were in the galleries that way as I was planning the exhibition. Um, so there were some things that were moving around. The Fred Wilson was a welcome addition um, after the installation was over um, replacing um, replacing a sculpture that had been there for a long time. Um, and I was certainly happy to be in conversation with that piece, but I, I was mostly uninvolved with how the works around mine were curated. So I was responding to them um, as opposed to me sort of bringing them in response. So I think that's an important thing to know and to understand as, I'm, as I put this show together. Um, and so then here ultimately, um, the edge of this top floor um, of the wall where you can see at least a little bit of both the front and the back. Um, and then ultimately in front of us, there's what I call an impossible stitch um, that has no end um, from front to back that loops all the way around this edge of the wall. Um, and then here are the two drawings that were shown in the corner of the upper galleries. Um, I'd started laying the groundwork for this drawing right as the pandemic was starting. 
um, it ultimately became the only thing that I was able to work on um, through the first months of the pandemic, listening to the news on the radio um, while trying to figure out how to draw these woven structures that I was interested in. Um, here there are certainly several different pattern structures that are overlapping with each other and then also intersecting with this um, spill of this watercolor that is breaking things up and changing things around. This is the other drawing that's made on the, or that's included on the top floor, um, shadow study. It's the first drawing I made where I started translating some of these photographs and photographic information into watercolor spills, um, which are then mediating between two different woven structures, um, causing an inversion on either side, and then also an interruption, um, an intersection as well. Um, I'll talk about the photographs that these come from a little bit later, but ultimately I was really interested in the photographs um, which are of my own body and my, or I should say my sh the shadow of my own body, um, creating pools and spills of light and shadow in them. Um, so this drawing here is the first time I was able to combine those. Um, which then ultimately brings me to my loom um, here with my longtime collaborator, uh, composer and sound artist, Paula Matheson, who's also here today. Hi, Paula. Um, we have, we've been working together for the past five years on a project titled Between Systems and Grounds. Um, and recently, since 2019, we've been working on reconfiguring this project to work with this computer controlled hand loom that's in my studio. Um, I'm not gonna go into that project today, but some of the patterns that I've developed for the current iteration of this project um, certainly became a part of the drawing. And so I think that that's important to note. Um, here you can see a graphical and numerical structures of these woven structures. Um, here the black is a simple woven ground and the white becomes this overshot or the stitches that weave over and under the black fabric ground. Um, so this impacted me. I was working on these as I was doing both the installation and the drawings and the drawings certainly were trying to figure out some things about these overshots. Um, and then those string structures that I was using ultimately go back to while a stitch, they are also this woven structure of this idea of something going over and under tackling front and back. Um, and so here we're gonna make maybe a quick transition. Um, into the galleries. These are this is on the other side of the of the art center. Um, so we would have taken a little walk for those of you who have not been to the art center before. Um, into the galleries that were designed by IMP in 1968. Um, here you can see a couple of sculptures from the collection. This is what the gallery looks like essentially today, right now. Um, this installation was part of a show called Black Stories that was curated by artists artists here in central Iowa, Mitchell Squire and Jordan Weber, um, that closed earlier this winter. Um, but some of the sculptures have remained. The show was comprised entirely of permanent collection works from the Art Center. And so here you can see some, a piece by Joyce Scott on the left, Wangechi Mutu in the middle, and Nick Cave on the right. Um, I will also note sort of the windows overhead and then also directly in front of us, um, the window in front of us became essentially for me the light source for thinking about this second installation. Um, and so this is just an approach. You'll see you can get all the way to the back of the gallery, not seeing these lower, the lower gallery space at all. Um, thinking about point of view and the strong verticality of what was happening in the Myers wing. I was really interested in juxtaposing that with a really horizontally oriented installation. Um, so here's a sort of first tip of what you can see looking over the edge. Um, you'll notice that there are small objects on these larger tables that have these watercolor drawings on them. Um, and then as we start to descend the staircase, um, you can see all four tables with the objects here. Um, so the tabletops here are worked from images uh, that I've been taking since 2015 um, of my of the shadow of my body um, on the ground while walking. Uh, the work that I've been doing in Turkey, right? I was thinking about this vertical idea of me trying to define a space with my own body. Um, and as I was moving around uh, during that time, I 
you know, lived in a lot of different places and was traveling to a lot of different places. Um, I instead took my cell phone camera and started pointing it towards the ground after I'd been looking at the ground in Rome um, and started documenting these walks, just my own walk. Um, oftentimes, I would say almost all of these are taken at noon um, where the sun is close to overhead, um, partic except for maybe the one flat in the middle. Um, here, which was taken early in the morning, but this was the first the first photograph for me where the shadow of my body started to become a spill of water. Um, this was taken almost exactly at noon um, in the ancient city of Claros, which is on the um, Aegean coast of Turkey. They also had this great, um, there's a beautiful uh, sundial there. Um, and so thinking very much about my body being a sundial um, and then thinking of this beautiful, it was a quarter sphere sundial um, in this ancient city to me made all the sense in the world. It was also very dry, um, but then this shadow being spilled across the ground became really important. Um, so these have happened uh, in all sorts of places and spaces. Um, and a lot of these are a part of the installation um, in lower pay, translated to essentially the size of my body, but the shadows again. Um, so blown up, enlarged, and then rendered in watercolor. Um, so here we have our first view on the ground. Um, so we have that overhead view where we can see these drawings. And then we also have this approach um, where the tabletops maybe, not that they become less important, but they become less of a, a drawing or a graphic. Uh, we also have these stacked tabletops that for me were imp an important part of the installation. Um, so there are 12, 12 tabletops in total, three stacks of four. Um, some of them have drawings on them. So people who experience the installation often are looking at what might be underneath or thinking about them in that way. Um, and also thinking about the way that some of these objects that are on the tables are made. Uh, a lot of them feel like sedimentary objects with layers piled on top of each other. And then also ultimately thinking about the soloit wall drawing in the background where we have all of these strong geometries and repetitions. Um, and so ultimately here you can see, you can't quite see the window to the right hand side, but I decided ultimately to think about that window as a light source and as the light source for all of those photographs as a way of orienting and structuring the tabletops in the gallery space. Um, so some are oriented horizontally towards the window, other perpendicularly, and some at a, a skewed angle. Um, these have everything to do with my relationship to the sun um, in the photographs that I was taking and making those drawings from. And so here's, one of the tabletops that's oriented horizontally towards the window. Um, so we, are, we have this overhead point of view um, where you can see things from up above. There are all of these different scales and experiences that are important to me um, with this work, the overhead view um, from up above and then approaching uh, with our feet on the ground and then ultimately also being able to see over top. Um, the tabletops are relatively low um, allowing for a little bit more access that way. Uh, and so here we start to see some of the objects and then the tabletop drawings. Here a port, what I call a poured plaster puddle um, next to this fragment of a shadow made out of watercolor. Um, and then here are two sculptures uh, that were made with really different processes, similar but different. Um, the top one, Mediate, is made from a 3D printed clay mold, um, which was developed in collaboration with Aaron Lindsay Hunt, um, who was a student and then alumni working at the Computation and Construction Lab uh, at Iowa State. Um, so she worked with me to develop 3D models um, that were moldable and flexible to then use a 3D clay printer to make the molds for these plaster objects. Um, so it, while it's hard to see in some of these photographs, the backs of these and the sides have this really striated um, construction um, that has 
for me has resonances also then with the building that IM Pei has made here where he has these poured concrete walls that are then also hammered. Um, the front sculpture equivocal is made similarly, but instead of with a computer model uh, that's then 3D printed with clay, those are actually just hand rolled pieces of plasticine. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see here, but there's about a one inch lift in that front piece um, from front from what's closest to us to far away, creating a slight inclined plane. Um, while not every object in this show is an inclined plane, a lot of them were either made that way or are shown that way. Um, this inclined surface, which has to do with the, which for me is a mediation of gravity, right? We've slow, slow gravity down by propping our table surfaces up has been almost always present in my work. Um, first thinking about, um, architectural drawing um, in an analog fashion, right? Where we have an uh, inclined table surface that's holding our tools, but also mediating gravity a bit. And then also the lace making table is always a space where gravity is mediated. We have bobbins that are, need gravity to create tension, but they also can't have too much because uh, it causes chaos. Um, and so for me, either subtly or very directly, the inclined work plane has been a part of my work. Um, and as I was making the drawings in Rome, I never quite felt right with them, either being totally horizontal or vertical. And I was always trying to find ways of showing them on an inclined plane. So I ultimately decided to make objects that could create surfaces for drawings that way. Um, and so these were some of the, the first components to do that, both with hands, handmade clay models and then also computer produced clay models. Um, the other thing that this allows for in the gallery space is if we're able to come over top, it also lifts the work a little bit towards our towards our face and towards our body and helps us understand um, how to how to look at them ultimately, both front and then also back. Um, the other thing that was exciting for me about thinking about plaster, um, well, there are a number a number of reasons I started working with plaster. One. Um, one of those though was actually the speed of making things. A lot of my work in the past has been very slow. Um, I'm very interested in, or actually only able to make, make things slowly so that I can think about them while I make them. I need that sort of physical connection to be able to think through things. Um, but then I also have these components of my practice that are faster. Um, photography is certainly one of them. And then this new move to pouring plaster where you just have minutes to make decisions um, has made a lot of sense to me. So at first they were poured surfaces that were meant for drawing later. And then ultimately I also started creating constructions and we'll see some more examples of those where I prepare surfaces that then become a space to pour plaster into um, and then later pull away from these, um, these made surfaces. Um, yeah, so ultimately the variable speeds for these objects in particular are really interesting to me. Some of them are poured quite quickly and then the surfaces were developed sometimes over weeks or months. Um, and then going back to this quick setting plaster again. Um, and then here we have the one table that's sort of askew in the gallery um, because of the nature of the photograph that I was working with. You can see um, a little bit of my own body in the back here, um, which ultimately is then readjusted to be perpendicular to the window um, here then with three objects. Um, and so here's the one that we were just looking at, um, photographed away here with some stacking um, of both plaster and then also some foam core um, at this compound angle that brings this drawing surface closer to us. Um, and then this one in particular was, the structure was modified by the sun while it was drying. And so it's essentially like a Pringle potato chip. Um, and here you can see these drawn surfaces that are then interrupted later with a spill um, of liquid. Another table um, here with our, our backs to the window yet again, and these two legs are shadows. Um, 
and certainly one of the most, one of the largest and also most intense surfaces um, of these pieces where we can see this line that's both very crisp and then vibrating, um, tilted up ever so slightly towards us. And here, one of the last tables um, with four fragments um, or sculptural pieces, some of the earliest ones happening here. Um, and here in this piece, um, this was actually probably one of the first ones of these that I started making, thinking about making tablets or um, fragments of places, spaces um, with a clay, just a hand, hand rolled clay edge to make this smooth surface, to make a drawing on. Um, then ultimately it was coated in rabbit skin glue as most of them were, um, which creates a nice ground for the watercolor on plaster. Um, and then a few different drawings and then ultimately some inscribings that dig into that surface that I've made, um, which ultimately peels up a bit again, becoming really reminiscent of um, also the walls in Pei and their, their texture and surface. Um, and then this last, last sculpture, Jannum, um, along with one of these walking panorama photographs, um, this one in, in Klaros, um, thinking about that sundial yet again, um, and the translation of that photograph here into a tabletop drawing. Um, and so that's my little walkthrough um, in the gallery. Um, I was certainly thinking about all this work um, while this show has my name on it. It is, man, you never make things alone. Um, and so I think it's always really important to acknowledge everyone who as a part of this, um, certainly with this exhibition, Jared and Jared Ledesma um, and Alison Ferris uh, for getting this started um, and thinking about it. Um, as something that is ambitious as it as it has turned out to be. Um, and then the installation crew um, who I was just thinking, man, you know, I could have put this show together myself, but I'd probably still be working on it right now, a month later. Um, so Jay Ewart, who runs the installation crew, and then Jeff, uh, Mindy, Zach, and Tom, um, I certainly could not have put this work together without all of their help um, and caring hands. Um, it's been such a great joy to work with the the Wayne Art Center staff, um, every single one. Um, I've been a regular at the Art Center for years, but to work in this way has been a real honor. Um, the Iowa Arts Council for supporting this project specifically um, through the fellowship that I've had this year. Um, and then Iowa State University, I had money both from the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, and then a lot of support from my department specifically, um, Ingrid Lilligren and also now Sarah Kyle, um, the two department chairs. Um, and then in my studio prior to the pandemic and a little bit since Megan O'Toole, Zach Brown and Becky Beckett have all been really helpful for me. Um, and to have here, I, I miss having all of you working in the studio for sure. Um, and then Aaron was Lindsay Hunt and Shelby Doyle, the competition construction lab and my spouse, Frouth Erdem, who supports me interact with you but um i like that you one thing you pointed out was the placement of the objects the watercolor drawings and the meyer wing um because that does have a a funny story where olivia we were walking through the meyer wing and um we were trying to decide where these watercolor drawings were going to go and the meyer wing is very tricky because there's so much light it's hard to install it, really anything in that wing. So um, thinking about safety for the drawings and Olivia suggested those spaces, those those corners. And I was like, Phew. I was like, you don't want to put them there. No one's going to see them. Like you, They're beautiful. You want you want people to see them. And she was like, Jared, that's the point. And and, uh, and it was like this this aha moment that I really um, that I enjoyed. And I think it's brilliant. And um, and I love it. And um, I don't know if there's a question there. I think that's just a nice story that I really like. And I think it helps people think about 
your installation and this idea of um, interruptions and mediate with architecture. Um, one thing that I want to talk about with you, and then maybe we'll go to questions, is something that you and I have talked about that hasn't really been talked about. Shannon mentioned it in her amazing essay about gender and space. And um, I think that's important to talk about um, because of these, um, you know, I am Pei and Richard Meyer, these um, star architects, so to speak, and introducing materials into these spaces and interrupting their architecture. Um, I think it's, it's awesome. And that's something that Laura um, and Allison and myself have thought about um, creating installations that interact with the buildings and also interrupt them, so to speak. And, um, can you talk a little bit about gender and the materials that you're using in these spaces in particular? Um, I'm sorry, Jerry, can you say that one more, the last part one more time? It's okay. I was just thinking more, we've talked a little bit about yep. your materials, fiber, um, the delicacy of the, the ceramics in contrast to the concrete and pay um, and the fiber and mire and the gridded architecture and you're interrupting. And then I, I wanted to share an image of this and I don't know how to do that. So I'm not going to attempt to, but we talked in a, a program previously about um, Dada and um, Duchamp's installation of the, um, the web kind of in the gallery and how he, Dada really introduced kind of this concept of the institution and interrupting it. And so with you, I think you're just bringing out these ideas and especially with gender um, and these two spaces. And I think it's brilliant and something that I would love for you to elaborate a little bit further on. Yeah, no, sure, Jared. I think it's interesting because I, I feel like I first came to textile work um, actually, as an architecture student, I was studying architecture, um, and it, it became a counterpoint to my studies that I later abandoned. Um, but I, I think even of like, man, like when I was applying to graduate school and thinking about all these things, I took this really sort of position about gender um, and textiles um, and that it's women's work and, and all of this. And certainly I still acknowledge and uh, appreciate that, that history. Um, but in some ways, my, also my understanding of it has become more nuanced um, over the years, particularly with my studies in Turkey, where actually the gendering, I mean, my spouse, Farat, um, who's here, I think was actually a big part of that, where as I was studying Ottoman embroidery in particular, I started realizing that, yes, a lot of these, a lot of these textiles were made at home by women in the way that we think of them, um, but also the royal textiles there were made by men in factories. A lot of weaving is done by men. So I think there, there's ultimately, um, gender is a really important part of the way that I think about my work and specifically the way I think about this installation, right? We talk, we, I feel like Jared, you and I have been talking from the beginning about um, specifically all of the sort of male artists that are in the gallery spaces while not exclusively so and I think you know you are certainly one of the people who's putting those works on display I noticed actually in my documentation photographs that there is not a single work by another woman seen except for in like as we're approaching the pay gallery but as I put things up on my website I wanted to acknowledge all the other works and not a single one they're all hidden behind other walls or out of points of view um, and so to think about and I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the wall as a ground and one where the art sits and then puncturing and undermining that ground or that space. And I think that that ultimately is what I'm trying to do with those stitches. Um, and I think that there is something ultimately also very, I'm, I'm actually not totally sure what direction ultimately that the gendering of that comes in, but that certainly that sort of slithering flow um, the acknowledgement of the front and the back, the also getting, or that there that there also isn't one and right. reducing any ideas of dominance, mm -hmm. um, I think is, or at least for me, sort of deciding that there isn't going to be a dominant place mm -hmm. um, and that the front or the side with the painting and the side without the painting are equally important um, in my installation, I think is, is, is all part of that idea around, around gender. I think then ultimately there are ideas around verticality and horizontality that have to do with, with gendered readings of things that 
were also important. I think as we've discussed even this show, right? Like the, the space has com contracted and expanded in certain ways. Um, and I originally was actually only interested in working in lower pay. Um, like that was my primary interest and concern because of the horizontality of that space. Um, and so then to bring in a vertical space like that Meyer Atrium becomes, um, they at least need to act, I hope, in counterpoint to each other. And I hope the people who have been able to see the show are able to feel that, the sort of balancing between the two. Um, Jill, I don't, I don't wanna to take too much time. I know, I want people to ask questions. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to jump in. There's um, a comment that just popped up in the chat and it says the scale of the ropes in the Meyer installation scales up the stitching of that to the ship harbor dock work on Meyer's handrails as a foil too. Yeah, absolutely, Leslie. And hi, Leslie. I'm so happy you could be here today. Um, I think uh, certainly one of the things that I was thinking about and as I was sort of deciding on the scale of the rope was thinking about like the fact that those handrails and the rope became the same size, but these like really different materials um, became important. I, and I think being able to kind of d dive over the edge in one of those balcony views, I think became an important part of that um, where we had the sort of the rigidity of those metal handrails and then the slack of the cotton rope. Um, Certainly the, the ship harbor dock work also is not lost on me. Um, and I think the relationship to labor there um, and maybe ideas around gender, gendered labor um, is I think another component, Jared, where that happens. Mm -hmm. um, all right, anyone, if you'd like to take yourself off of mute and ask a question. Go ahead, Leslie. Oh, were you just waving? I just realized I wasn't on camera. So I'm sorry, I'm like lurking in the questions there. Uh, the work is amazing, Olivia. And, and honestly, I really feel like a visceral reading of the space, even just from uh, photographs and walking through. So uh, kudos for <laughs> finding a bridge for us. But I think that scale shift is really apparent, the kind of heft and labor of the vertical um, especially with the Chamberlain and the Martin, you know, like it's all the kind of labor. And I'm actually what I'm not sure about because I've unfortunately never been to the art center is, do you see the Meyer installation first and then you travel to the pay? Like the experience you've walked us through would be the experience. So, so we're actually invited into a more intimate space, the more horizontal later. Yeah. Or is so it depends? In the cart well, Currently, the art center has a, a dedicated walk path for the galleries because of COVID. Um, and in that sense, I, I almost feel lucky. Like I actually really wanted people to see Meyer first. Um, and then it happened to be that the walk path is through what we didn't see today, which are the main galleries. Um, and then you come into the Meyer gallery and get sort of the middle view of my installation first. Um, and so it is very directed in that way. Um, I would say even if you came to the art center without that directed path, it's often that people will come in through the main galleries, go over to Meyer, and then make their way to pay. It is sort of circular in nature in that way. Um, but setting up the two, um, sort of the L shape that they ultimately make, I don't have, I feel like I attempted to make some like really long sections through the building as I was thinking about this, but they did become very long. Um, and so ultimately aren't really practical to show, but, um, Thinking about also all the different floor levels that were happening and where those things were occurring was important. Um, so yes, you you would go to generally go to Meyer first and then later see pay um, horizontal, much more quiet. Um, but also after you again walked through, there's at least one other set of galleries that you would walk through in between. But the little uh, the little beautiful shadow weavings in the nooks is your clue. That's the little breadcrumb you leave for the next the next portion. Exactly, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Exactly. Well, you, yeah, I was I was wondering um, when you were talking about the other works that are in proximity to your your work and the relationship with those. I, 
would would you have wanted to have the opportunity to curate other works in those spaces that that the the weaving work would have had conversation with or are you did you like responding to what was there I mean I think I think that would have ultimately been a different show mm -hmm. um, if you know if I had been sort of working in a more curatorial lens shall we say instead of one so it would have been one of making instead of response. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, to me, that's actually like a completely, a, a completely different. different exhibition that, okay. that could have happened, I, I suppose, um, but certainly not this, this go around. Yeah. Um, but certainly thinking about the, um, the show that was up right before COVID came down um, and how beautifully those works were put together in the main gallery. Um, man, that was, that was such an exciting show. I was so sad to see the Carla Black exhibition and the way that she worked with the gallery, the pieces. That said though, the main gallery is much more, I hate to use the word neutral, but it isn't sort of a architectural space that has quite the complexity of either Meyer or Pei with, with different things to deal with. So I was also responding, I was foremost responding to the architecture and then also to the pieces that um, that were there, some of them more impromptu than others. The Glenn Brown painting in particular, like when I was in the galleries, I was like, oh, of course, these are squirrely little, little fun lines that um, are, feel like, feel like ropes. And that, um, if, where, how that's situated in that top gallery, you really have to enter into the space then to see your work well in proximity to the Glenn Brown. So if you were to just like to peek in and look at things from the edge, you really miss that beautiful entanglement there. And that, that was, um, I, there is a question posed by Julia in the, um, in the chat, but I, I, I was wondering if there was anything um, that made itself more um, obvious to you or not obvious, but you became more aware of when you were working in those spaces that you hadn't noticed before in the Richard Meyer building or in the IMP building. Um, just thinking about them like from your studio and then going into the museum and thinking about it there. Oh, I think there is, but it's not coming to me right now. Certainly I, I feel like the Meyer, help. like, hmm? go ahead. Go ahead, Jared. Um, I was gonna point out how you saw the Bryce Martin in kind of a new, I love that. Um, that's an object, but. No, the, I mean the Bryce Martin painting in particular because it was absent for the whole two week installation period. And then it came back on Friday morning and I feel like Jared and I were like, oh, this is a different painting now. Um, so that, I think that that was one thing that, that really changed for me. Um, as well as, I mean, one thing that evolved over the time of making the show that started with a conversation with Jay actually was um, actually like just how that wall is made. It, it took me a really long time to understand it. Um, it's like, I, it just took me a long time. Um, it wasn't something that I'd been focused on previously as we often are not. Um, and then to realize that it actually terminates at the top floor, it doesn't, it doesn't have an, you know, it just has a cap on it. Um, as opposed to being, you know, usually we find walls that are sort of engaged in a, in an angle or, you know, they don't necessarily have an end that we can see. Um, and so thinking that really changed my idea of what that wall was and that it was actually an object and not necessarily architecture. I mean, it is architecture, but it's also an object. Yeah. So Julia asks in the chat, um, if you can talk about when I have to pull up the chat again, um, share, be, would you be willing to share the moment long ago in your career when you realized fibers and textiles could best illustrate your ideas and interest of the world? Great question. Yeah, that is a good question, Julia. Um, I feel like for me, I mean, it started happening when I was an architecture student and I picked up a crochet hook, um, I would say again. Um, but most clearly for me, it happened actually in my studio. Um, you know, I I'd finished my bachelor's degree. I worked in New York for a number of years doing catalog photography. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to sort of continue having a practice as an artist while my day job was also um, being the thing that I was trained to do as an artist. They didn't seem to fit anymore. Um, so I started becoming interested in making objects and trying to continue making drawings. And I spent four months making this big rubber knit doily. Um, and I put it up on the wall and I started using it to make a drawing. And I think that that was where that started clicking for me um, was, was in that 
the space for like, I had this structure that I made that was also a drawing. And then I was able to translate that structure um, from a textile to a drawing and back and forth. It was really fluid. I have to also, um, you know, starting graduate school, I then, um, and Anne Wilson is here. I have to really credit her with pushing me towards looking at lace work um, as I started graduate school to start to think about this place. In my research that I was doing then, I found bobbin lace, which I still work with. Um, and it became this place for me where I could make a drawing and have that translate into a structure um, instead of the other way around that I had been working. And so all of a sudden, all of the things that I was interested in in both drawing and architecture and space making became really clear um, and accessible through a textile process. Um, so Julia, I hope that that, does that answer your question a little bit? Um, she said yes. Yeah. In a, in a very pretty way. It's a beautiful story about materials, space, and structure. Thank you, Julia. Would anyone else like to take themselves off of mute and ask a question? How many of you have seen the exhibition? You can raise your virtual hand or your real hand. Oh good, I see a lot of people have visited the museum. We did, um, Olivia, uh, take the, the, the directional path around the museum did recently come out. So people will have a little bit more free form uh, procession through the museum. They can choose their own way that just happened. Yeah, that, I'm curious how, how that will change. Actually, I was there on Friday and I guess I noticed that the stanchions were down. Oh yeah. We saw each other. Um, oh, someone is asking if you made the rope. Um, I did not. This was certainly something that crossed my mind as I was starting to make, make this installation or think about this installation. I decided that ultimately um, a manufactured cotton rope made the most sense. Um, it felt like the most direct relationship to a, a thread. Um, I also, just being realistic, like the, this installation, the final proposal for it was in September for a show that came together and went up in March um, and to make the thousand plus feet of rope um, out of what material uh, seems maybe not like the way to go this go around, but it is, it's a hundred percent cotton rope, undyed, undyed cotton. Um, so this sort of natural, it's a little bit different. Um, it's not the bleached white of the wall, you know, the gallery white paint. Um, so it does have a textual, textural and color difference there. Um, one thing that is not able to be seen in the, I think in the installation photographs all that well is actually the little bit of lift um, that it also has that comes off the wall. I think that part's really important um, where you, it gives a little bit of a shadow and a little bit of space. So you can really feel the, the rope coming out and off, off the wall. Um, but yes, Annie, the process for me is so important. Um, and so actually the, that whole component of this has been a little bit alien for me. Working at the scale, um, which is a scale that I'm like thrilled to be able to work at, um, but then also the mechanics of how that happens. Um, and then ultimately also how all of the connections are made um, with the rope and the wall um, was, was all kind of new, new to me for this project. I think Catherine had a question. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, wonderful presentation. I am so excited to see this work, friend. And um, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more about gravity and the, the, the role of gravity in your installations and in this in particular um, gravity and like tension and yeah. Yeah, I feel like I did, I spent like, first like eight, six or eight years of lace making, like doing yoga postures actually that were like mimicking the structures that I was making. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, gravity, gravity and tension and particularly working in bobbin lace, they're kind of two sides of the same coin because gravity with bobbin lace, gravity makes tension. Um, on a loom, other structural forces make the tension. Um, but that, as you know, Catherine, the tension is essential for making the structure. You can't make it without 
Um, and so, yeah, I, in many ways it, com it comes from that, right? And then thinking about this, this sort of mediation, but then I guess I also have this, you know, things that have gone against gravity. And then more recently I've been much more inclined to sort of, shall we say going with the flow, right? Like really allowing gravity to take over and thinking about more horizontal, um, more downward looking, um, downward looking things. Certainly spaces between tension and slack are things that I, I feel like it's hard not to work with those when working with fibers and textiles. Um, it just seems they're so of the material that it's, I think, hard to ignore. Or if you are ignoring it, you're certainly going against the material inclinations, um, which has never, never really been my, my MO, I suppose. Um, so there are certain things in this exhibition that are unnatural for me in that way, but then also thinking about all the different ends. I always have many unfinished ends in my work um, for any number of reasons, but the way that they also are allowed to sort of sit with gravity, but also then use their own gravity to make tension um, seem, seem important. I don't know if that's getting totally at what you were curious about, but thanks for the good question though, Catherine. There, take myself off mute. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? If not, I'm going to give you all an assignment that you have an hour. The art center is free. <laughs> you can, oh, I, we still are taking reservations. You, uh, but you probably could get a drop in at this point on a Sunday. I hope you do go and see Olivia's um, exhibition. It, the photography is, as, as great of a photographer as Olivia is, I think that there's nothing that can replace seeing artwork in person and seeing it in the changing day and then the changing seasons right now. It's really extraordinary in, in all of the locations of the museum. Um, and so Olivia, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. Jared, thank you for um, working with Olivia and hosting the show for us in Des Moines. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I know we had someone on from Germany, maybe some folks on from Turkey that Olivia had connections with. Um, so near or far, we really appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon. And Jared, would you like to say anything in closing? No, I think you said it. Please come and see the show. Um, well, actually, we have we are in the works of making a virtual tour of it as well that will be on our website. So it will live on our website forever. Um, so if you can't make it to Des Moines until um, May 16th, the exhibition will be on our website and you can experience it virtually, which will, it's just quite wonderful. So thank you. All right, so in our in the Zoom world, we do these funny little virtual claps now and waves. <laughs> All right, Olivia, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. And thank you all of you for coming. It's really lovely to see all your faces um, and get to talk with all of you about the show. <laughs>